Okay, now since we just finished talking about thermodynamics, we reviewed uh, what enthalpy and entropy in Gibbs free energy is, let's go back to the discussion that we had about solutions and see how this all plays out. How do we apply what we know about thermodynamics? How do we apply that to a solution? So again, that equation that we talked about, that was the Gibbs free energy equation, delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. Okay, and delta H, we know that that's enthalpy. And we know if it's uh, if we get a positive value, that tells us it's endothermic. If we get a negative value for enthalpy, that's an exothermic reaction. And then delta S, we know that that is entropy. And the entropy tells us how much order is in a chemical system. Okay, and, and so we want to know randomness. Okay, so what can we say about the sign about of the above equation for dissolution to occur? Okay, so if we want a solid, if we want a crystal to break apart and release ions, we need delta G to be negative. Okay, so we need delta G to, G to be less than zero because we need this process to be spontaneous. Ideally, we want this, we want to put our crystal, we want to put our stuff in water and maybe mix it up just a little, just to provide a little bit more oomph, but we don't want to be constantly heating this or constantly stirring this just to make everything dissolve, okay? So now that we know that we want delta G to be negative, let's talk about each of these other terms in that equation. So you have the delta H, you have the enthalpy. So remember, enthalpy could be positive, which means that heat is being absorbed. Or enthalpy could be negative, which means heat is being released. Okay, and also uh, delta S, the value for delta S, it's generally positive. Most of the time it's positive. There are a couple occasions where it's negative, and we'll talk about that in a minute. All right, so we have this figure right here that can help us describe what's going on. So we've got two different types of solutions. One solution is on the top, one solution is on the bottom. So in the first solution, you have a solid solute, a liquid solvent, and so you mix it together. So both of these, the solid solute has a lot of order to it, okay? So the S, the entropy here would be negative. You have a liquid where the liquid, there is, I mean, it is in a container, it is pretty ordered. It has no other atoms or no other no other materials in there except the liquid that we're dealing with. Okay. But when you mix these two together and make a solution, the entropy becomes positive. So it becomes more random. Okay. Same thing if we have a liquid solute and a liquid solvent, same thing. The so, the the uh, liquid sol uh, solute would have a negative entropy. The liquid solvent would also have a negative entropy. And when you mix these together, it becomes more random. The entropy becomes positive. So again, you're going from ordered with the solutes and the solvents to random with the solutions. Okay, we can also look at this as, as a table as well. So here is a table of certain enthalpies and entropies. So here you have lithium chloride. The enthalpy of the solution is negative 39.0 kilojoules per mole. The entropy is positive, positive 10.5. Uh, if we go down to KCl, the enthalpy of the solution is a positive 17.2 uh, kilojoules per mole. The entropy there is 75 joules per kmol. So it looks like, looking at this table, you've got a negative value here, you've got two, three, 
four negatives, and then you've got one, two, three positive values. So it looks like for the enthalpies, okay, it looks like when we're talking about the enthalpies, delta H, it could be positive or it could be negative. But looking at all the entropies, delta S, all of those are positive. Okay, so what can we say about the relative magnitude of these terms? Uh, as we're looking at the sheer numbers for the enthalpies, they're pretty much positive and negative. They're, they're pretty much in the same ballpark. For the entropies of solution, same thing. They're, they're, between, or they're between 10 to, it looks like the 89 is the highest number. So what can we say about the relative magnitude of these terms? They're similar to each other, but keep in mind the units. So the units for, for enthalpy is kilojoules per mole. The units for the, the entropy is going to be joules per k-mole. But since delta S is really joules per k-mole, the delta S will actually be smaller. So while the numbers look to be about the same, you know, about the same, you know, relative ballpark, in actuality, because one is dealing with joules and the other is dealing with kilojoules, the entropy is going to be the smaller one, smaller the two. So as we can see from this table, uh, what experimental param parameter can be used to indicate the, the sign of the first term? Well, that term, temperature. Temperature can be used. Okay. Now, as you can see from this table, not only are the enthalpy vari charges uh, changes variable with no discernible pattern, some are positive and some are negative. Okay. And so what we're going to do next, now that we've talked a little bit more about thermodynamics, let's go back to the interactions that we talked about either before. We talked about solute-solute interactions, solvent-solvent interactions, and solute-solvent interactions. How does that all play out together along with everything that we talked about with thermodynamics? So let's now talk about the three types of interactions that we have. We can have solute-solute interactions, solvent-solvent interactions, and then solute-solvent interactions. So we're going to go with the weakest and then move to the strongest. So let's talk about solvent-solvent interactions first. So what can we say about the sign of this interaction as part of the heat of the solution? Well, we can say that the change in enthalpy, uh, when we're talking about the heat of the solution, it should be positive. So it's going to be endothermic. Okay. Now, we want to give a molecular dis level description of what this parameter represents. And what we're talking about at this level is that we're, separ we're separating the molecules. So we have separation of molecules. Now, what, what parameter is responsible for this term? So the separation of molecules, how does that happen? It's because of intermolecular forces. So what we're trying to do at this level is to disrupt the intermolecular forces between the solvent molecules and solvent molecules. Okay, so that's what we're seeing at solvent-solvent interactions. What about solute-solute interactions? Okay, so what can we say about the sign that this interaction is part of the heat of the solution? Well, delta H, the enthalpy again, is going to be positive. Okay, so, so this is again another endothermic value. Okay, now give a molecular level description of what this parameter represents. Usually if we're looking at a... Uh, if we're looking at solutes, you and you, we go back to our example of sodium chloride in water. That, in that sense, those ion, those are ions that we're dealing with and not molecules. So here, what we're talking about is a separation of ions. What parameter is involved or responsible for this? Now, think again, going back to the sodium chloride in water uh, example. When that sodium uh, sodium chloride crystal is breaking apart, those sodium chloride ions are kept together, are held together by ionic bonds. So we're trying to break the ionic bonds. So if you guys remember back in Gen Chem 1, 
the uh, that's lattice energy. Lattice energy is the am the amount of energy that we need to break one mole of solid ionic crystals into their respective ions. Okay, so what parameter is responsible for this term? Lattice energy. All right, so now let's talk about the biggie. Solute solvent interactions. All right, so what can we say about the sign of this interaction as part of the heat of the solution? This time, the enthalpy is going to be negative. So this is going to be an exothermic portion. Okay, so we want to give a molecular level description of what this parameter represents. This is hydration. So this is where your solute is going to interact with your solvent. Now, what parameter is responsible for this term? All right, so again, you had ions for solute, solute. You had molecules for solvent, solvent interactions. So now what we want to look at for solute, solvent interactions, this is going to be ion dipole interactions. Okay, so putting all three of these, solute, solute, solvent, solvent, and solute, solvent, what can we say about the combination of these parameters? Well, first off, it depends. So I know that's kind of a glib answer, but we need to take a look at some stuff. So like, for instance, the size and the charge of the molecules or the ions, they influence the parameters. Okay, so this figure below is actually a graphic representation of what we just looked at. Okay, so here's our figure that here's our image. So if you know if everything's working properly, okay, so here you have the solvent solvent interactions. This arrow is red. This is going to be a positive value, so it's going to be endothermic. The solute solute interactions, these also will be a positive value. But when the solute, solute and the solvent come together, that should release some energy. So the change in enthalpy for the solution should be negative if the solute-solvent interactions are the most dominant interactions of all. Now, if it goes the other way, where let's say the solute-solvent interactions are not as dominant as the solute-solute and the solvent-solvent, then you're going to get an endothermic solution. Or you're going to get an enthalpy value that's that's going to be positive. It's going to be endothermic. So what gives? How can you have solute-solvent interactions that are going to be weaker? Or that's going to be a positive value. So for the left-hand side, where the enthalpy of the solution is going to be a negative value, we tend to see stronger interactions. And those stronger interactions that we see, we should be able to see hydrogen bonding. We should be able to see dipole-dipole. And we should be able to see ion dipole. Over here where the enthalpy is positive, so it's an endothermic solution, we're going to have weaker interactions. So we tend to see London dispersion forces. Okay. And so that's it. That's that's pretty much what's what we're getting out of this. That the stronger the interactions, so if we have hydrogen bonding dipole dipole, ion dipole, usually we've got some sort of polar solvent that's interacting with an ion or another polar molecule. We tend to have a, a we tend to have an exothermic solution, or the enthalpy of the solution is going to be exothermic. If we have a weaker interaction, like London dispersion, solvent-solute interactions are going to be the weaker, and they're not going to be as dominant, so that means the enthalpy of the solution is most likely going to be endothermic.